In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Sprasnikum, happy feast. We celebrate today the feast of the Dormition of the Most Holy Theotokos and Ever-Virgin Mary. She who is the Mother of God, Theotokos. And she who, as we are in Christ, is the mother of us all. And on this day, there is, you might say, mixed feelings, at least for me when I come to this feast, I always have mixed feelings, though both of them are exceedingly blessed. So on the one hand, whenever there is a death of a loved one, there is always grief. And the grief comes from love of the person and the fact that there is a separation there. The object of our love, whom we could pour it out upon, you might say, becomes absent. And this grieves us, rightly so. Death is tragic. We don't go in for, as we see these days, where somebody dies and we celebrate their life alone. We believe that it is proper to grieve that it is an expression of love. A priest friend of mine once told me that somebody came up to him and said, when I die, I don't want you to be, be sad. I don't want you to, to grieve. And I thought that's, that in and of itself is a sad statement to restrict our loved ones. That's, that is an outpouring, perhaps a profound outpouring of love to, to go through that. Now, for us, of course, on the other hand, the Lord is risen. And the Lord is victorious over death. Death becomes a means of communion, you might say, a way by which we enter into the presence of the living God. Now, of course, we are already present in the, the present of the, excuse me, we are present. The Lord is present to us. Even now, we will receive his body and blood. But as we know, when we die, there is that journey that, that we undergo, and we have a profound encounter with our God. On this day, when we remember the dormition of the Mother of God, we remember her death. As I said last night, uh, when we read the Synexarian, it, it noted that in the West, particularly in the Roman Catholic Church, the feast of the assumption is celebrated, and I make a joke, and, and forgive me, uh, that we don't make assumptions in, in the Orthodox Church. Uh, this the, uh, this uh, dogma was dogmatized in 1950, along with the Immaculate Conception, which was a uh, based a hundred years earlier, 1854 which basically says that the mother of God was free of the heritage of Adam, immaculately born. That means that she did not have the ancestral sin or original sin, whichever you prefer, um, and its consequence, death, and therefore Mary did not die, but was assumed into heaven. Now, of course, as Orthodox, as I mentioned last night, we reject this. The dormition of the mother of God, and I'll make another note here, and, and the accounts of it, which we receive uh, from a number of apocryphal writings, which are not the apocrypha, as is understood in the West, as I mentioned last night, 
not the Apocrypha, but older books, and some of them, you know, some, some of them are called the lost books of the Bible, and another priest friend of mine says they were never books of the Bible and they were never lost. Um, but some of those texts do have within them some historical accounts which we see as valid, which we receive. Uh, we do not accept, of course, the Gnostic texts like uh, the Gospel of Thomas and uh, some of those. Um, but the accounts of the life of Mary, the tradition of our church says, are actually historically true, correcting some of the doctrinal errors, of course. And so some of those texts are the pseudo John the theologian, the pseudo Meliton, and of, of course, on this feast, you'll see in the icon, there are present two hierarchs. And these are the first century saints and hierarchs Herothius and Dionysius the Areopagite. And in the writings which are attributed to Saint Dionysius the Areopagite, particularly in the divine names, this particular writing, there is a, a detailed account of many of the things which we say occurred in this feast. For example, Thomas being absent. And it, it would be rightly so that Thomas was absent from not only the funeral but the burial and he didn't believe when he came back. And he wanted to see the body of the mother of God and when they opened her tomb, her body was not there. And so we believe that as the mother of our God, she was privileged to enter into the resurrection immediately, to be taken up, to be present with her son at his right hand. Backing up a bit, more specifically to the feast, we celebrate also, this is more on the, that other hand as I mentioned, we celebrate today because on the one hand while Mary dies and she is separated from us, now it's 2,000 years later and so of course she would be separated from us, but we have the memory that she underwent death. And this is always a tragedy. The separation of the soul of the, and the body was never meant to happen. And in the fall, it happens. On the other hand, she is received, and we see it in the icon, we see her soul in swaddling clothes being received by Christ. And so because of this, we rejoice. We hear frequently said, so, uh, proverbial sayings have arisen in the Orthodox Church, and one of them is that Mary is not the great exception, but she is the great example. And so, because she is the mother of Christ, and we all we know, do live in a world where there's a lot of dysfunction, but we all know the feelings that we have for our mothers as human beings. And I mentioned last night my own personal uh, story uh, regarding my mother. And it always makes this feast hit home, doubly. Because on the one hand, I miss my mother, and on the other hand, I rejoice that, you know, as the saying goes, she's in a better place. She is gone to her reward. I am not, <laughs> bear with me here, I am not Jesus. I am hopefully a, de a disciple of Christ, a, a priest of Christ, a servant of Christ. But if I had my way, 
I would find a way to receive my mother. If there was a way, I would beat the doors down. And Christ, who took on flesh, became a human being, we say that he endured every temptation, but without sinning. To be sure, I can only think, and again, this is just my own opinion, my own personal experience here, but I can only think, I can only assume that Christ has that similar feeling for his own mother. You see where I'm going with this? So today, Christ, who is the God of heaven and earth, who has risen from the dead, receives his mother. That becomes an icon. Because he receives her in this way, we see what is in store for all of us. We see she be, that in that she becomes the great example. That this is what we are striving to do. We are striving to attain holiness. We are striving to attain sinlessness. That is, that we, no, we won't sin. That's a great struggle. Can any of us do it? I don't know. Mary did it. I won't go into the details how she did that. That's for other, other feasts of Mary, which you'll hear about uh, when those feasts come. But Mary did it. She is also our encourager. Mary says yes to Christ all of the time. May it be done unto me according to thy word. On this feast day, when let us bear in mind that when Jesus says to John, Behold your mother, and I mentioned this last night, and with this we'll conclude. When Jesus says to John, Behold your mother, and of course to Mary, behold your son. This doesn't just stop with their relationship. She becomes the mother of all of Christ's disciples. And because of the great mystery which we receive, that is that we are baptized into Christ, we become members of Christ's body himself. Mary, in a mystery, becomes our mother. On this day, as we contemplate this, let us rejoice that the path is laid before us which, which Mary has walked. She is united to Christ and with her Son and her God in the kingdom of heaven. May we ask her prayers. May she intercede for us as we are on this path, on this journey to the kingdom of heaven that we may not be distracted, as, as we heard in the epistle. That we may not be distracted, or that our distractions may become less and less, that we too may be united with Christ our God. And also let us rejoice that we have such a great intercessor, such a mother who truly cares for each and every one of us. In the name of the Father and of the Son.